Indeed, my name is Mikko, and I spend my time with the worst of the worst on the internet. I spend my time tracking the organized online crime gangs, tracking the scammers, the spammers, the criminals, the malware writers. And even though I've been doing this for basically all my life, I've never lost the hope for the internet. Because I think we're all unusually lucky to be alive right now, to be alive during these defining years for the mankind. Because we have to remember we are the first people who really live their lives online. And while internet has clearly exposed us to many kinds of new risks, it has exposed us to many, many more benefits. So much connectivity, so much business, so much entertainment that the internet has brought us, that the downsides pale in comparison. And if we really want to fix the problems that the internet has created for us, we only really have two problems to fix. And those two problems are the problem of security and the problem of privacy. Now, fixing privacy is unusually hard, because that's one of the things, I mean, breaching privacy is one of the things that has made internet so useful to us, because all the services we use are free. You get free access to things that you used to pay money for, but of course they're not really free. You pay with your privacy, you pay with your data. And with that sense, we might have already lost the fight on privacy or lost big part of it. But let me give you one practical privacy tip. And that is about webcams. And we, we of course, all know the risk that somebody might hack your system and gain access to your webcam or the, the camera in your laptop and then they might watch you and that's an unnerving thought and, and you can fix that by putting a piece of tape or a post-it note on top of your laptop camera which is, which is what I have done but the tip I have is even better don't put a tape over the camera instead tape a small mirror on top of the camera so if you get hacked then the hacker will only see himself. <laughs> right? I should probably patent that idea, right? And we can also think about the two problems we have in particular regarding security. Because when we look just at just the security problems, we can divide those into two problems. Technical problems, and people problems. Some of the security problems we have on our systems are coming out of vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities which basically in the end are bugs in the code. And we will always have bugs in the code as long as our programs are being written by human beings. Because human beings make mistakes. But then again, we also know how to fix the technical problems. We fix them by fixing the bugs. We fix the bug, that fixes the vulnerability. Then we just make sure everybody updates their system, and we're done. But we can't do that with people. We can't patch people. We can't update their brains. At least, we can't do that yet. And we can try to do it by educating people, but that's hard. It's, it's unusually hard to make people learn anything about security. And these failures, failures of human beings, keep biting us all the time. For example, let's have a look at passwords. And it's a little bit disheartening that we even have to think about password problems in 2016. But this is one of the core problems we have. And the typical mistake here is that people choose bad passwords or they use the same password everywhere. 
And the, we actually know this from questionnaires. There's around 20% of people who only have one password. And I don't mean that they have one password, the password management program. They really only have one password. They, they use the same password on every system, everywhere. On their webmail, on their corporate VPN, on their online banking, one password. So if it gets compromised in one place, it's compromised everywhere. But you don't have to be stupid to recycle your passwords, because we, we saw this very well this summer when the news of the LinkedIn breach became public. LinkedIn was breached in 2012, four years ago. But the database was actually released only this summer, a couple of months ago. And there were plenty of victims in this breach. Actually, 60 million people lost their email address, their password, and some other pieces of information. And after this breach, it was quite obvious that many people had recycled the same password in multiple different sites. One person who was burned or who was, got caught in this, in this breach was Mark Zuckerberg, the guy who founded Facebook. He was part of the breach. So we know his password. His password was da, da, da. <laughs> and he used the same password everywhere. Well, on all social media sites, every single site except Facebook. On Facebook, he had something stronger. But on Twitter and Tumblr and everywhere else, it was da, da, da. So you don't have to be stupid. I mean, obviously, he's not stupid. He's a clever guy. Very, he's, he's, he's very clever. Yet, he gets burned by problems like these. And you know what? He wasn't the only victim. I was a victim as well. I was a victim in the LinkedIn bridge. Because I had a LinkedIn account in 2012. I wasn't really using it for anything, but I had an account. And I learned that I was a victim this summer. And I actually, when I first heard about this, I didn't hear it from LinkedIn. The first notification I got from a service called Have I Been Pwned? And this is something I recommend to all of you. It's a website called Have I Been Pwned? You go there and you leave your email address. And then when there's a data breach, like LinkedIn, they will mail you and tell you that, by the way, your email address was in this data breach. And if you use the same password somewhere else, you should not only change it here, but change it everywhere else. And this is a trustworthy service. I know the guy who runs it, Troy Hunt from Australia. Recommended. Have I been pwned? But why was LinkedIn breached? I mean, why was it breached? Well, we probably should ask this guy, because this is the guy who is right now being investigated about the breach, who's right now under arrest for this breach. His, his name is Yevgeny Nikulin from Russia. He is under arrest for this case, and if he turns out to be guilty, he's the person who was selling the database for four years. So he was making his money not by misusing the data, but selling the data to other hackers. So how would those other hackers convert this information into money? Well, there's multiple ways, but the most typical one would be that they would take those uh, 60 million email addresses and search for Gmail addresses in there. Just search for addresses which are from Gmail. And of course, that would be probably, I don't know, 40% of the email addresses there might be from Gmail. Then they would try the LinkedIn password to Gmail. Just try if, if that's the password for that Gmail account. And if it is, they just got in to your Gmail archive. All right, what would they do next? Well, they would search the history of your Gmail account. And as you know, Gmail never deletes old emails. So they might have your last 10 or 15 years. What would they be searching for? They would be searching for registration emails. You know those emails when you get, when you register to your new site? In particular, they would be searching for registration emails from online stores. Online stores where you most likely have saved your purchasing information. So they would find eight-year-old emails about some online store, and then they would try logging into that store. Now, with very bad luck, the same password would work even there. But even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because now they know that you have an account in that online store with this email address. So they would go to that online account, to that online store, and they would click the magic button. Because every login page has this magic button. The magic button which says, I have forgotten my password. And when you click that magic button, then the online store will send you a new password to your Gmail. So services like Gmail have become a single sign-on system 
for all the online stores you use. If your Gmail gets breached or your webmail gets breached, attackers can gain access to online stores. And then they can start ordering PlayStations and laptops with your account. So how much money can you make out of selling databases like these? Well, we don't actually know exactly. But Yevgeny, the guy who's being investigated for this breach right now, has been active on social media. And if we look at, for example, his YouTube accounts, he's uh, showcasing his cars. <laughs> That's a Lamborghini Huracan together with an Audi R8. And according to his Instagram, he also has a Mercedes, an Aston Martin, a Porsche and a Rolls Royce. Crime does pay, right? But we have to remember, he's actually caught. If he turns out to be the right guy, he will go to jail. Now, for the last couple of weeks, the headlines in tech media have been about the Internet of Things, IoT, and Industrial Control Systems, ICS. Now, have any of you ever seen what nuclear reaction looks like? It looks like this. And today, when you look at any nuclear reactor, they're all being controlled by computers and software. Actually, everything around us is being controlled by computers and software. And this is a very, very fundamental change. It's especially fundamental to us computer security people. Because for years and years, we thought that our job as computer security people is to secure computers. Turns out our job is not to secure computers. Because today, those things are computers. Everything around us is, is computers. Every single company has become a software company. Every single company has become a software company. A car manufacturer company is a software company. A food processing plant is a software company. A power plant is a software company. So our job is not to secure computers. Our job is to secure the society because the whole society runs on computers and software. And one of the main mechanisms of securing your devices is to try to restrict the attack surface. And the easiest way to do that is to keep them disconnected from public networks, so it's harder for the attackers to reach them. That's not a foolproof solution, but it sure makes your job easier. So don't expose your systems to public networks if you don't have to. Which sounds very simple and turns out to be surprisingly difficult in today's world of IoT. And we know this because we regularly scan the whole internet and we find things from the net which really clearly should not be on the internet, which clearly are on the internet by accident. Industrial control systems exposed to public net by accident. How could that happen? All, all too easy. You have a configuration mistake. You have one remote connection added for administrative purposes. You misconfigure a router. You have legacy systems that you don't know about. So when we scan the net, then we find things which really shouldn't be on the internet. And we often find them with no authentication. So there's no username or password. And you end up with a control interface of an ICS system. Now, I know most of you can't read Finnish, but here's a headline from a Finnish newspaper from last week. This is from the Länsi Suomi newspaper, and the headline says, Kenttämiehiä odotti kahlu allas, häkkerit sulattivat äijän suon jään. What they're saying is that uh, these are the guys who were running a local hockey ring in the uh, small town of äijän suo and some unknown hacker hacked into the control interface of the hockey ring and melted the ice of the hockey ring. 
And this is, of course, a problem which is only characteristic to Finland. <laughs> for example, here in Sweden, I'm sure there are no control interfaces for hockey rings which would be exposed to the internet with no username and password. And then there's a, another tip about security systems, which is that if you set up a security camera, especially if you set up a security camera so you can monitor the status of your plants, <laughs> put a password on it. <laughs> and this IoT revolution is getting a little bit crazy. There are IoT devices that I had no idea we would actually need. Let me show you an example. This is an IoT mattress. Yes, a mattress. You know, a mattress that you sleep on with IoT functionality. So you have a mattress which you connect to the internet. Now, why would you actually connect a mattress to the internet? What, what's the functionality you're going to get? Well, it has a sensor for contact zones. So it can tell you if your bed is used in a suspicious way. <laughs> this is real. I mean, <laughs> I'm not making this up. They actually have that. And yes, that is quite funny. But what's not funny is that three weeks ago, we saw the largest IoT botnet to cause the largest denial of service attack in the history of the Internet. This was the so-called Mirai botnet. And there is no single Mirai botnet. The last time I checked, there was 55 different Mirai botnets. They are all based on the same source code. Source code which was released by the author of this botnet around four weeks ago. A hacker which we know by the name Anna Senpai. As he or she released the source code four weeks ago, we've seen a massive amount of copycats running these botnets. Botnets which contain hundreds of thousands of infected devices, none of which are computers. They're all IoT devices, because that's the only thing Mirai tries to infect. And it's actually very basic in the infection logic. It's simply scanning the internet, trying to find IoT devices. And then when it finds an IoT device, it simply tries logging in over Telnet, not even over SSH, over Telnet using passwords like admin admin or username admin password admin or root default or support password or motherfucker. <laughs> and this alone enables it to gain access to hundreds of thousands of devices. I don't know if there were any smart mattresses amongst those botnets that were used to launch the attack, but maybe it's just possible. And today the situation is that you go and buy for example, a security camera, and you just plug it on the internet without configuring it at all, which means you don't change the password. In less than three minutes, it will be infected by Mirai or by one of the Mirai botnets. So it happens so fast that by the time you're reading the manual, you're already infected. And this is a little bit sad, because right now it seems to be that the Internet of Things itself is becoming a clear and present danger for the Internet. And this is not what we were promised. But maybe it's just too early. Maybe this will get better. Like I mentioned in the beginning, the Internet has brought us downsides, new risks. But it has brought more good things than bad things. And maybe that's the same thing that will happen with Internet of Things. Maybe in 10 years' time we can look back and then we can say that yes, IoT exposed us to new kinds of risks, but it brought more good things than bad things. We don't know that yet, but we can hope, we can wish that that's the future. Another big thing which has been in the headlines for the last couple of weeks has been governmental hacking especially related to the presidential elections in the United States. Now, let me be clear. I don't believe that governmental intervention or governmental hacking from the Russian government 
change the outcome of the US presidential elections. <laughs> but I do believe they tried. I do believe they tried. We can actually link back the hacks which were targeting Democratic National Committee or the Clinton email servers themselves back to earlier attacks which we link to Russian government. And Bloomberg Television did an interesting interview with President Putin. During that interview, Putin was asked straight up that, you know, who hacked the Democrats? And it's interesting what he answers. He answers, is that really important? Does it even matter who hacked it? The important thing is the content of the emails. There's no need to distract the public about who did it. There is no need to distract the public about who did it. We shouldn't worry about who hacked the emails. Instead, we should be looking at the emails themselves. So when I was younger, it was the hackers that were the ones which were causing havoc and leaking and releasing private information. Today, it's government causing havoc and releasing public information. It sure is strange, but that's where we are today. You might have heard the saying that data is the new oil. And this is completely true. Data is the new oil. This is how many of the IoT startups are planning on making money. Not about, it's, it's not necessarily about providing new features over the internet to our home appliances. It might be even more important to collect information about the usage of those appliances. To get data, because data is valuable. And this will quickly lead to a situation where you will buy home appliances and you don't even know that they are IoT appliances. I mean, you go and buy a toaster and there is no IoT features. I mean, why would you even need IoT features in a goddamn toaster? But it's going to be online anyway. Why? Because it's going to become so cheap to put it online. And the benefits it creates are not benefits for you, the consumer. They're benefits for the manufacturer. Because now they can con con uh, collect analytics, like how often do you use the toaster? Or where are you? Or about failures? And that's valuable. And as you collect data, and if data is the new oil, you really should be also worrying about oil spills or data spills. Data is also becoming a liability. And the more you collect it, the more liabilities you have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Well, I feel like home. <laughs> I used to make some of these parts as well. Um, and it is a number of areas that we need to worry about. Big data, as you said, Internet of Things. But you didn't mention mobility, which is another area for concern. So do you have any comments on that? Sure. When we look at our smart devices, I mean, smartphones or our tablets and things like that, that's an area which actually also gives me hope. Because when we look at how, how security has changed over the last 10 years, uh, well, over the last 10 years we got Android and iPhone and these systems, and they are much more closed as environments compared to you know, our Windows or OS X or even the old Symbian smartphone systems. And being closed has downsides, but it also has secu security benefits. And the situation right now is that it's clearly more secure to surf the web with your tablet than with your computer. So for security, mobile devices are actually a big step uh, further. They do have still big problems with privacy, because many of the mobile vendors make their money by collecting information about you. And m most of the free apps in app stores make their money by collecting data. So mobile devices make our privacy problems worse, but they actually make our security problems in a little bit way going away. As long as the users choose to protect them properly, that mm -hmm. is. I mean, 
like I said, we always have the technical problems and then the user problems. And we can't patch the users because there is no patch for stupidity. No. <laughs> is that a shame, isn't it? Yes. So just a final one. Uh, you know that, I mean, I, I do appreciate the digitalization of society because there's a lot of lovely things that you can do. And, but it had also been a, a, a area for innovation even within the information security area. What would be the next big step for information security, do you think? Well, I mentioned earlier that if we want to get rid of vulnerabilities, we have to be able to fix the bugs. But what if we wouldn't have bugs at all? What if we could actually create code that wouldn't have bugs? Which sounds like an impossible thing to do. And yes, it's very hard to do, but I also do believe that we are living the age where we will, during our lifetime, see artificial intelligence. So it might one day be that the code in our programs will not be written by human beings. It will be written by an AI. And when we have a superior intelligence writing the programs, it won't make mistakes. Or if it makes mistakes, those are so hard mistakes to exploit that we will never be able to exploit them. And you can still blame the humans. Yes, um, the, the downside will be that all programmers will be out of a job, but you know. Oh, there's other things you can do, like cleaning up cabins on Ferris. Oh, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> we so. have uh, a, gif a gift for you. The, oh, um, I, ho I hope it's booze. It's not booze. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, an IoT device. An IoT device, exactly <laughs> yeah. what I need. It's a toaster. <laughs> It's a, it's a little robot that is not connected to the internet oh. yet. All right. You feel free to <laughs> connect it to that. the internet. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much. Or fill it with much booze. Much appreciated. Yes. Even better than booze. Another warm hand for <laughs> Miko Hirpanen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Ja, spännande och intressant. Det har varit ganska mycket om farorna och nedsidorna med internet idag. Men det är också Men är det inte lite baksmälla liksom för internet är det? just nu? Ja, ja. Men det händer rätt mycket. Det händer mycket bra saker, men det händer också mycket tråkiga saker. Men det är det vi ska rätta till. Förlåt, jag fick ett meddelande här från min madrass. Jag måste gå. Oh. <laughs>